This week's episode of Sounds Good is brought to you by the folks who make my podcast happen, Gradient. They recently launched their full editorial website filled with tons of articles advancing identity and culture. Go check it out at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Hello, everyone. Brandon Harvey here. Welcome to this week's episode of Sounds Good, the podcast where every single Monday I sit down with an inspiring person and talk about happiness, overcoming struggles, and living a life of intentionality and adventure. This week, I have Joshua Dubois on the show. Joshua is a former assistant to President Obama and became the president's friend and spiritual advisor. Often described as pastor-in-chief, he was named one of the 100 most influential African Americans in the country by The Root and Ebony Magazine. He's written four cover stories for Newsweek and is seriously quoted in a big article for mainstream media on like a weekly basis. It's crazy. Joshua is now the founder and CEO of Values Partnerships, a consultancy that's worked with Paramount Pictures, Oprah Winfrey, The History Network, and ABC's Shark Tank. Today, Joshua and I dove into the idea of finding hope in politics, which I think is especially fitting considering how crazy politics are in the United States during this season. And I want to mention, kind of as a side note, that I was super nervous going into this conversation. I mean, I was like one degree of separation from the president of the United States. But as soon as Joshua started talking, his calm and kind demeanor calmed me down again. That's just kind of the guy he is. So I loved our conversation. I thought it was so great. I hope that regardless of your faith tradition or your political affiliation, you'll keep on tuning into this episode because it's a good one. Let's jump straight into this. All right, I'm here today with Joshua Dubois. Joshua, welcome to Sounds Good. It is great to be on with you, Brandon, and and hello to the Sounds Good community. (laughs) So I just want to start off by saying the other day I was scrolling through Instagram and and I'm friends with uh, with Pete Souza, the the president's photographer, and I saw him post a photo and I was like, wait a second, I recognize this guy. (laughs) And it was you and your lovely wife and your almost one-year-old kid, uh, August, hanging out in what I believe was the Oval Office with the president just going like goo-goo over your kid. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, man. We, um, you know, the, the president has played an important role in uh, my story and in our family and um, has just been a, um, a, a wonderful support and mentor and friend over the years. And um, he asked us to bring uh, August in to hang out a little bit. <laughs> so That's we got so in there cute. and he uh, took a photo and jumped down on the uh, the carpet in the oval with him. And August drooled on his desk a little bit and we had a good time. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's so good. I heard rumors that you can attribute the president uh, to you and your wife getting married. Is that true? Well, yeah. So, you know, we met, um, uh, Michelle and I met when I was working in uh, then Senator Obama's Senate office, and she was working on Capitol Hill as well. And so we actually met at something called a constituent coffee. Uh, My wife's from Chicago, and uh, uh, Senator Obama at the time invited um, his constituents to have coffee with him on Thursday mornings, and she was one of the people that came over. Um, I remember her, one, because she was awesome and beautiful and um, really smart, but also because she's five foot zero and she was standing in line to meet um, Senator Obama and she was standing behind Dikembe Mutombo, <laughs> who was <laughs> having coffee with him at the time as well, who's like, you know, seven foot three. And so it was this amazing contrast. I'm like, who's that short lady standing behind <laughs> Dikembe Mutombo? And so we struck up a friendship then and uh, later started dating. And um, and when we were dating for a few years, uh, uh, President Obama by that time pulled me to the side and said, what is taking you so long? Why have you not proposed yet? Uh, to make a, a long story short. And so, yeah, he he had uh, has played a, a nice and helpful role kind of creating the spaces for my wife and I to connect. That's incredible. That's great. And you've been married how many years now? A uh, little bit over two years now. Yep. That's great. That's so exciting. And, okay. And if I back up a little bit, um, I understand that you decided to apply to work for Barack Obama um, after watching his speech at the 2004 Democratic National Convention, which it was an incredible speech, one of the best speeches I've seen from any sort of political arena. Um, and 
can you tell me about that process of applying to like to go work for this guy? Yeah, man, it was um, it was wild. I, I, I didn't watch the speech in person. I was actually at a restaurant, a, um, a little pub um, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. I was interning in between uh, two years in graduate school um, in, in New Jersey, um, but I was in D.C. Uh, doing an internship. And was basically grabbing a burger and uh, saw this speech that was on the televisions there. Um, and it was then State Senator Barack Obama giving this amazing speech. And he was talking about all the stuff that I really believed in and bringing people together and all the policy issues that I really cared about. And then out of nowhere, he said, and, you know, we worship an awesome God in the blue states. And, you know, my, my faith is important to me, but I'm also kind of a progressive guy. And I thought, man, this is a Democrat who doesn't mind talking about his values. And so I just sort of um, got interested in him then um, and wrote a bunch of letters uh, to his camp, his Senate campaign and got a bunch of form letter responses. And, uh, you know, one day saying decided to form letter responses saying no. Yeah, yeah, saying no. Um, I'm actually looking at one now. I keep a, a copy of one of the no letters in my office. Um, oh, that's amazing. Uh, next to a photo of, uh, of a meeting with the president in the Oval Office, just to be a reminder of, you know, what's um, what's 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 possible um, with with grace and hard work. But um, but yeah, so I got a bunch of responses and decided one day that you know. Um, I would just drive down from New Jersey to D.C. and just kind of show up at his office. So I did that and didn't go that well. They were like, <laughs> no, we've got way too many applicants and um, uh, you're going to have to, you know, not do this again, <laughs> not just show up. And so I drove back to, to Jersey and two weeks later, I said, let me give this one last shot. I really feel like I'm supposed to be there. And so I drove down again. And they um, arranged, uh, when I got there, they arranged for, they said they were going to let me at least meet with a very senior person in the office. And so I had a conversation with, with somebody in, in then Senator Obama's office and wrapped up the conversation and drove back up to Jersey feeling pretty good. And then I Googled the guy's name and, find, and I found out he's the IT guy <laughs> in the office. And so, oh. uh, so it, you know, that didn't go that well either. But I, that that journey down twice gave me some leverage to, to email the, the legislative director and say, hey, listen, man, I, you know, I've been down there two times now, you know, basically eight hours round trip on I-95. Is there any way I can get an interview? And um, and he wrote me back and set up a phone call. Um, and eventually, you know, I had a I, they allowed me to come down for an in-person interview and was hired in the office. So it was um, just a wonderful journey with a lot of grace and, and providence and, you know, probably a little bit of annoying behavior on my part that um, they got me in the door. Oh, that's so good. I love I love people who are just total go getters. Uh, do you feel like you've always been that way? Have you always been like a mix between crazy and hardworking, or is, was that just something that was really, really like a passion of yours? Where like I'm, I I want to chase after this particular thing. You know, it's funny. I've always been scared to death by big opportunities like that. And honestly, like I'm like almost frozen, but then have that last final impulse to like, you know, to to jump out there. It's 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 this Ooh. weird dynamic where I'm like the last person to get on an amusement park ride or, you know, t- I, I have no desire to skydive. I mean, that's just not something. But at that last final moment where if it's really important, I don't know how to tell myself no. Like, I don't know how to not jump out there. And so um, it's it's kind of an interesting balance where I, I don't consider myself in sort of the, the medium scale everyday things. I don't consider myself all that much of a, of a risk taker. But when you're sort of right at the edge of the cliff and, you know, you, you need to jump off and, and, and try to fly, that's that's the moments where, you know, for some reason I have a crazy impulse to, to jump out there. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But um, but yeah, that's uh, I guess that's the best way to describe it. That's incredible. And and yeah, really that time, that jump, that leap, that, that risk worked out. Um, yeah, in this case, it, you know, it was, um, it, it did. And, you know, again, I, I don't think it was anything about me, but I think it was just more about, you know, just kind of being in the place that I was supposed to be. Yeah, that's incredible. And a few years later, Barack Obama gets elected president and you are 26 years old and he taps you as somebody he wants to bring into the White House with him. Um, yeah. Wh- like I'm 23 right now. I can't imagine in three years having a job where I answered to the president every single morning. What was that weight of responsibility like? What like what did your college friends and like what did your family think? Yeah, I, you know, it was um, it was definitely a significant responsibility. I, I didn't think too much about sort of the age thing. In fact, like 
the president didn't even know my age. I was I was intentional and almost annoying in not telling anyone my age, even when asked. <laughs> That's so, smart. You know, I, I, <laughs> it, it was just kind of never a factor for me. I, I I'd always kind of been in situations where. Um, uh, you know, you, you had to perform alongside people who you know had more experience than than you, and so it it, it didn't really um, come, come into play. Uh, other than the fact that you know, I mean, the president may not have known my exact birthday the entire time I was working for him, um, but he did. He was very intentional about empowering young people. So you know, um, his chief speechwriter, my friend John Favreau, um, who who worked with him on some of the most iconic speeches you know, in our country's history was right around my age as well. Tommy Vitor, who does a, does a lot of great work for him on foreign policy, or even Ben Rhodes, who's a couple years older than us, but um, is a really wise and uh, careful um, advisor on, on on foreign policy as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of good folks in the, at the time in their late 20s and their 30s and their early 40s who, you know, the president's bottom line was, I'm not going to give you any extra points just for being young, uh, but I'm also not going to hold it against you. And if you can bring it, so to speak, if, if you can, you know, bring the, the, the dedication, you know, the love for the for your country, for people who are marginalized, if you have good ideas and you take the time to, to vet them and, and to, um, to let the, the, the best ones bubble to the top, then, you know, I'm going to give you a shot. And so that, that's the one way it did play in um, is the fact that this is a president who really um, does not let age become a barrier for him in, um, in finding, you know, finding people who can do their jobs. That's incredible. And yeah, it, and it I think that that just pays off for the president. You know, it, he's getting people who are great, who are trusted, who feel appreciated and um and yeah, and you did a wonderful job at your job. So that's great. So you're working closely with the person with the most scrutinized job in the entire world. What is it kind of like to deal with that kind of pressure and is there a weight of responsibility in having a role that uh that's pretty important to the president? Yeah. Well, there's certainly a tremendous amount of scrutiny on the president and everyone that, that, that works for him. You really have to do your best to just do your job and realize that sometimes people are going to like that job. Sometimes people are going to hate that job. Sometimes people are going to know what you're doing. You have to uh, have have kind of a tunnel vision to some extent of you know what's most important. What Who are the people you're supposed to serve this day? What are the, the, the accomplishments, the goals that you've set for yourself this day, this week, this month, this year? And then if you lay it all on the field every day, and if you can look yourself in the mirror at night and say, I pour as much into this as I can, then then you're okay if people love it or if they hate it or if they're neutral, like because you know that you've, you've done your best. It sounds a little cliche, but I mean, really, you know, approaching each day with a finish line in mind. And if you cross your own personal finish line, whether that's operating with integrity or, you know, serving people in the way that you want to serve them, then, you know, at least for me, and I think this is the case for the president as well, you're okay if sometimes people don't like that or sometimes, you know, they they disagree with you because, you know, you know that you you have done your absolute best to to fulfill your own responsibility. So that that's kind of the yeah. way you know we try to approach things. Absolutely, and I guess if you if you're always creating or if you're always doing things uh, to appease the critic, then you're never going to really be successful. It works much better to work to appease the people that uh, that like and appreciate what you're doing. And of course, you want to take constructive criticism into account, but at the end of the day, like it doesn't do you any good to focus on critics. So I like what you said about tunnel vision. I think that's really valuable. So for those who don't know about what you do, um, every single morning you send a snippet of scripture to the president in the form of a devotional, kind of mm-hmm. uh, almost like a morning pep talk or morning wisdom. Um, and you actually published a book on it. And uh, and I loved it. I read through the whole thing. Um, and your book includes a whole lot of emphasis on um teachings and advice on how to love others, but especially how to love your enemies. Why did you think that this idea of loving your enemies was such an important idea for the president? Well, you know, I think it's important for the president for the same reason. I think it's important uh, uh, for everyone because in the, in, in, you know, in the final account, our enemies in a lot of cases aren't really our enemies. They're people with whom we share a common humanity. Oftentimes, they're people who have similar hopes and dreams. And if we can find those points of commonality, 
you know, I think the world would be a whole lot better place and we'd get a lot more done. And so that's really one of the, um, uh, one of the reasons I focused on it was to sort of deconstruct the notion of who an enemy is in, in the first place. Absolutely. Uh, but also, you know, sometimes there are going to be people who just purely disagree with you. Um, and I think, you know, everyone can get along well with people that get along well with them, right? Every, you know, when, <laughs> um, it's, it's not a difficult thing um, to not scream at a good driver. It's a difficult thing to like not scream at a bad driver on, on the road. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, um, a test of character or integrity or strength um, to, you know, not get angry at your spouse or your brother or your sister or your um partner or the people that, that are close to you or your coworker when they're making you happy. Like that's not a, that's not hard. Um, the, the real challenge is, you know, what happens when, you know, we're stretched to our breaking point when, you know, people are doing something that we gen- genuinely think is wrong or misguided. How do we navigate that conflict? How do we navigate that tension? And, um, and I think that's really where, you know, we, um, or, where you can really make progress just as a person is learning to, to navigate those places, um, of tension. And so I tried to focus on that both for the president, but also just for myself and, and hopefully for others who now have read some of these devotionals. That's incredible. I, yeah, I think that's absolutely important. And I, I really admire what you said about, it's not hard to, it's not a testament to your ability to love people if you're just loving your friends or just loving your spouse. It's much more of a testament to your ability to love people when you love somebody who is either opposite of you or very like anti you, you know? Um, yep. I think that's great. I think that's great. Yeah. And and so I read through this whole book, you know, and I it's really fun being like, okay, cool. Like these are uh, things that like Joshua sent to the president's Blackberry every single morning. In the process of doing this, did the president ever give you topics where he's like, hey, like, I would really love for you to send me some stuff focused on this. You know, I'm dealing with X and Y every day. Can you offer me A and B? Was there anything like that? Yeah. You know, I don't know that it was as kind of micro targeted as as that, but he would definitely provide his reaction at, at some points or say, you know, I like that. And uh, I like the message today or the, or yesterday. Um, there was one time early on. So I started sending these um, on the campaign and then continued in the White House. And, you know, there were a couple months where I didn't receive a whole lot of feedback. So I thought, you know, maybe he's not reading these things. Um, and I, I'll take a little break, you know, I'll take a couple of weeks off and then restart. And I get a call from Reggie Love, who at the time was his body man. Um, he's sitting in the outer oval and he's like, hold for a phone call from the oval. And I answer the phone and it's Reggie. And he's like, uh, the president's wondering where his devotionals are. <laughs> so, so that was kind of cool to see that he was actually reading them, but also a little embarrassing as yeah, well. Yeah, you got busted. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, um, I try to focus in on topics that I know are um, of interest to him. I talk about jazz a fair amount because he's a he's a big music buff and a jazz fan. I talk about history a lot because he's a history buff and, you know, try to uh, distill some lessons from previous presidents and, um, and then, you know, w- weaving in scripture throughout. So, yeah, those are some of the areas of focus. Man, that's so fascinating. I think that a lot of people would say that working with the president would be really, really cool. But obviously, in any president's tenure, there are some really horrible moments. You know, Bush yeah. had 9-11, Clinton had Columbine, um, and the president has said, Barack Obama has said that the darkest moment in his presidency was uh, the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in 2012. I think that the story of what you guys did in response to that was a really humanizing and um, and powerful story. Would you mind sharing a little bit about what you guys did and what that experience was like? Yeah, I mean, and I should say at the outset that uh, um, first off, I didn't do I didn't do much of anything other than just kind of be there and be with the president in that in that time. Um, and the second thing I should say is that no matter what he did, and I thought it was really important, it still pales in comparison to the tragedy that those families face then and the, and the stuff they're still probably going and I'm sure they're going through right now with the loss Absolutely. of you know 20 kids babies you know elementary school students and then you know six um, teachers and staff as well I mean it just kind of boggles the mind when you think about it um, I'm happy to read just a little bit of an excerpt from um, from the book this is from the essay that begins the May devotionals and it's called done in secret um, 
starts off, you know, the White House is not supposed to be a place for brokenness, um, just sheer shattered brokenness. But that's what we experienced on the weekend of December 14th, 2012. I talk a little bit in the essay about how I was sitting at my desk um, when we got the news that there was a gunman in a school. And I was just incredulous. I was like, I thought that there's no way this could be the case. But then the facts came in and you realize 20 children killed, six staff um, and it was just, you know, terrible. And that that news sort of began a weekend of numbness. And I w- kind of shook out of it on Saturday when I got word that the president wanted me to accompany him to Newtown. Um, he wanted to meet with the families of the victims and then offer words of comfort to the country at a memorial service. Uh, I, of course, said yes, left early um, to help the advance team sort of set up uh, spaces for the families to gather behind the scenes. Uh, we didn't know what to do, but basically assembled a few classrooms, put tissues and you know water in each classroom, and there would be two or three families in each room. Um, the, the family sort of gathered together. Um, they were, were trying to be as respectful as possible of the you know the president coming in, but you could tell they were just completely shaken, um, and it's you know so understandable. It barely needs to be said. Um, went downstairs when the, the president came in and went downstairs to greet him, and I provided him an overview of the situation. You know, it's basically, sir, there are two families per classroom, and the fam- first family is, and I tell him that family's name. That their child was, I tell him the deceased child's name and the second family is and, you know, so on. He sort of took a deep breath and steeled himself and went into the first classroom. And as I wrote, you know, what, what happened next, I will never forget. Uh, person after person received this engulfing hug from the commander in chief. He, he'd look him in the eyes and say, tell me about your son. Tell me about your daughter. And then would sort of hold up pictures of uh, the ones that we'd lost and, um, as they would, des- the parents would describe their favorite food and their television shows that they liked, or even the sound of their laughter. And then there were younger siblings there, um, you know, maybe two or three years old, um, who were too young to really understand what was going on. And the president would try to sort of get them to laugh a little bit. He'd grab them and toss them up into the air, or hand them a box of White House M and M's that he had in his pocket, and you know, it's just a really touching moment. And you know, in each room, I saw his eyes water, but he never broke down. And, and then the the scene would just sort of repeat itself over and over again. Uh, he'd move through, you know, almost 100 relatives, and um, everyone received a personal attention, hugs, looks directly in the eye, support, prayer, whatever they needed. And just remember thinking um, that this has got to be taken a toll on this guy, Um and of course, and I note this as well, that this is, you know, whatever comfort he was able to provide is, you know, completely inadequate in the sp- face of this particular loss. But it was just a small measure of love um, on, on that weekend. And then, the, you know, the point that I, I make at the end of the essay is that, you know, that, as I mentioned before, President Obama has never really spoken about these meetings. He talked about gun violence. He talked about the policy issues, but he um kept this to himself. And, you know, um, I know lots of different faith traditions out there. And in my tradition, Jesus teaches us that some things, you know, the holiest things, the most painful and important things we're supposed to do in secret, not for public consumption or display, but as service to others and worship to God. And then, you know, the the teaching that, that I believe is that God who sees what is done in secret will reward us, um, maybe not now, but certainly in eternity. And and that was one of the, the lessons that I learned from the president and the most important moments that we will have and that show our character most, the most important moments we'll have on this earth are not when the cameras are on and when you're in front of people, but really in the way that you treat people in private and in mm-hmm. secret when no one's looking and when you're not trying to, uh, to teach a lesson or, you know, um, get some credit or anything like that. You know, the president's never really talked about those meetings and, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a place where, you know, his character really shone through. That is so powerful. That's so incredible. Yeah. And I think that the most admirable thing in that is that this was something that was done in secret. Uh, I, I would love it if, you know, every single guest I have on this podcast, people who are, you know, people of influence, people of power, instead of talking about their greatest accomplishments, they kept their greatest accomplishments to themselves and let those things be. Um, more impactful because they were just done out of a 
decision to make an impact, not because they needed the bragging rights or anything. Yeah, um, yeah. My pastor, Mark Bashan, always says, you know, I, I don't, I don't need to be famous in the world. I want to be famous in my own home, and I, I love that notion. That like, yeah. Uh, he also says, I want the people who know me the best to respect me the most, and I just yeah. think that's such a powerful idea that like. You know, if I mean, that's when you know that you've made it when the people who are closest to you that know you the best respect you the most. That's the ultimate goal. That was a little bit of a heavy topic, but I'm I'm really glad that we got to jump into that because I think that's such a powerful and humanizing and intimate story. Um, I want to ask, you know, you worked in the trenches of the White House for years. You're still in the heart of D.C. right now in the world of politics. I think it's a really frustrating and hard place for a lot of people. I think a lot of people are just a little bit overwhelmed by the current political climate. What kind of wisdom can you offer people um, for, you know, keeping a hopeful approach to um, what's happening in politics right now? And and maybe you could even like talk a little bit about what's being done uh, behind closed doors, you know, the, the hopeful things that are happening behind closed doors. Yeah. I mean, I would say the first thing that hopefully will encourage people is that I truly believe the American people are so much better than American politics right now. You know, that, <laughs> that, um, that, you know, we, there, there are certain exceptions to this, but for the most part, you know, we're a country full of really good hearted people who love their families and they're trying to do right by their community and, you know, trying to have an impact on, on the world. And you don't always see that reflected on cable news or on Twitter, um, but that's that's the case. And I think we've got to remind ourselves of that um, and let that encourage us that no matter what background or race or ethnicity or perspective folks are coming from, that um, that that's uh, that is in fact the case. Um, and so I would say that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, I would really focus on um, – on the issues. Um, yes, our politics are kind of broken right now and I'm happy to speak about particular candidates uh, that concern me, but, but there are also some really uh, important underlying issues that are up um, for debate. You know, how are we going to stop human trafficking in this country and around the world? How are we going to, going to reform our criminal justice system and give people who have been locked up a second chance and, and have more equitable criminal justice policies in the first place. How are we going to pr- protect our environment, man? And, you know, make sure that my baby son at eight months old has a, has a, a planet that he can breathe and live in, in, in the context of, of climate change. I mean, these are not Republican issues or democratic issues. These are not liberal or conservative issues. They're just um, tough challenges um, that creative people of goodwill can, can really solve. And so I would really kind of focus in on those issues. I do think it's important, you know, for those who are so inclined to, to not give up on engagement in politics in the public square. There's a lot at stake, particularly right now. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that. But um, but even if, if you're not gung-ho about, you know, particular um, candidates, um, really kind of honing in on what, what issues are important to you, to this generation and the next generation is, I think, a, a, an important lens. And remembering that, you know, again, I, the American people are better than American politics and that, you know, there are a lot of good folks in this country still. Yeah, I think that's incredible. And um, I think that as soon as you kind of identify core issues that you care more about than, you know, core parties or anything like that, um, then it gives you the opportunity to actually do something about it. You know, if all I care about is voting Republican or voting Democrat, then, you know, if I don't like the candidate, I don't, I can't do anything about it. But if what I actually care about is, you know, the environment or what I actually care about is, you know, criminal justice or human trafficking, those are things that even if I am not able to vote for a presidential candidate that aligns with me perfectly, I can actually go out and I can make an impact by loving my neighbor, by uh, by spending time with people in my community, like that, you can get really hands on with that. So I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree. And on that same note, how do you keep a positive perspective? Not necessarily specifically with politics, but just when you're inundated with something that feels over your head. You know, what have you found works well for keeping a positive perspective on a more general note? Yeah, I mean. 
you know, again, we all come from different backgrounds and belief sets. And, you know, a lot of that for me is, is grounded in my, in my faith um, and in the, the way I see the world through that, um, through that lens. And I, and I realize that, you know, as important as what's happening right in front of me, that, you know, my, my worth and my value lies somewhere that's bigger than myself. Right. And so, um, so that's, a, I think, an important piece for me. So, you know, no, no matter what happens on a day to day basis, I'm not, I'm not bummed out. Um, I mean, I definitely get bummed out from time to time, but, you know, it's, um, I, I realize that, you know, there's, there's, there's something broader on, on the horizon. And so I think that's an important piece for, uh, for me. I think in, in addition to that, I mean, it really is the power of the human spirit. It sounds almost cliche, but, you know, again, you, you get out into the world and Brent, you know this, man, you, you've been all over the world interacting with some amazing, phenomenal people telling their story through, um, through pictures and words and, um, and, and you realize that man, every person is just, um, has something so unique and special about them. So they're fearfully and wonderfully made. They, they, they are just kind of shaped in this, this, um, in, in this really unique way. And if you, it's almost like a treasure hunt starting each day, trying to figure out what, what's good around you. Um, and it may not be right on, right. Um, Right, right on the surface. But if you dig a little deeper inside people and in communities, you're going to find something. And so really having that spirit of curiosity, of wonder and going out and finding what's beautiful in the world um, is, I think, a, a cure for the doldrums um, and, and uh, for, for the things that get us down. Having a spirit of curiosity and wonder. That's, I, that's my like ultimate goal every day. And I'm so glad that you put it that way. Okay, so at the end of my show every week, I love to ask a few specific questions to every single guest. And at this point, we're a few months into this, and I want to evolve this a little bit. And so I'm going to tweak these a little bit to be a little bit more catered to you. Um, So my first question is, there's a lot of negativity around politics right now. And I more so want to ask, like, what do you admire about the political system? Like, where do you see good in the actual system? Because I think, like we said before, it would get really easy to be like, Okay, let's just throw, let's just throw it all away. Let's not pay any attention to it. Um, but you know, as an insider, what do you see? Yeah, I, I admire that we have a pretty open and pretty free and pretty fair political system, even if we don't like the outcomes all the time. And there are some issues with that. I'm really concerned about restrictions on voting rights and voter ID that are particularly impacting minority populations. But generally, I mean, we're not living in an authoritarian government where. You know, reporters are being arrested and minority political parties are being and leaders are being put in jail just because of 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 their beliefs. And so I I admire that even when I don't like the outcomes and even though I'm increasingly concerned about voting rights, um, by and large, we still have a pretty open and pretty fair political infrastructure in in this country. Um, again, I have to underscore that there there are some problems. There are absolutely some problems, but we're we're not living in you know Eastern Europe under communism or in China or in other places that are um, that are more restrictive. And I think that's something to be thankful for. That's a really good way to see that. And I think that it's really great that like you're able to have that perspective from within the system rather than me being an outsider looking in. So Thank you for that. My next question that I normally ask is, what are you consuming right now? What are you watching? What are you listening to? But I I more so just want to know... Kimmy Schmidt. If you... <laughs> <laughs> I love Kimmy Schmidt. Along those lines, though, Scandal, no. Veep, West Wing, or House of Cards, which are you more likely to sit down and binge well, watch? I, I love Kerry Washington. She, she's a wonderful person, and um, we've done, you know, had different interactions over the years. I, Scandal has gotten a little bit out there for me right now, and so oh, it's ridiculous so, at this point. Um, <laughs> It, I mean, I could say the same thing about the second season of House of Cards, although I think it just it came back with a bang in this past season. So that was solid. You know, I've never seen an episode of The West Wing, which is appalling to everyone that I know in Washington. <laughs> so it's, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, so I, I, I couldn't make that comparison. But I am absolutely unlikely to be watching anything related to politics when I go home. I am... Um, man, I'm a, I'm a nerd, man. I, my wife is so appalled by the fact that I will watch like hours of antiques roadshow. Like I am, I mean, I am, there's some ways that I'm, (laughs) there's some ways that I'm a typical millennial and some ways that I am not, man, that you, you put me in front of HGTV antiques roadshow. (laughs) Is that insane? It's, It's kind of embarrassing, but now I've told the world, so it is what it is. 
Uh, that's so good. Uh, everybody has to tweet Joshua about yeah, that and embarrass him appalling. because that's now fantastic. I, now I regret it. <laughs> now I regret having shit. I'm just oh. kidding. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we're keeping that in the show for sure. Um, my last question for you is, um, based on the ways you've chosen to step out and live your life differently, what's one thing you'd encourage someone else to do in their own life? You know, so whether it's part of your journey of how you got to where you are and the ways that you've lived into what you do or what you've seen uh, with the president, you know, what's something you'd encourage someone to do in their own life today? Stay humble and hustle hard. Um, It sounds like a t-shirt slogan, which it probably is somewhere, but you know, it's really those two, two sides of that coin. And, you know, remember that you don't know everything that you need the wisdom of other people that you, that there's a much bigger world than you. Um, and, and let that humility settle down deep in your bones. Um, uh, I think that is so important to start with humility, but then get out there and go for it. Do the work. Once you're grounded in humility, you know, just to take those leaps and, you know, that I think the heavens will open when, when we jump out there, but it's important before you do that, before you try to shoot for the stars to, to understand, um, you know, you're just your own humanity and, and to, to approach uh, life with a spirit of humility and then jump out there and, and beautiful things are going to happen. Humility and hustle. That is fantastic. That's a perfect way to wrap up this episode. Joshua, if people want to find out more about you, follow along with your baby pictures yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or find out about your book, where can they find you? Uh, so the book is The President's Devotional, um, and it's on Amazon and other places where books are sold, um, in Barnes & Noble and so forth. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Joshua Dubois. Um, I, uh, my Instagram is Hey Dubois, H-E-Y, Dubois, like, hello, Hey Dubois. Um, and, um, <laughs> but it's mostly baby pictures, more substantive co- stuff comes on Twitter. My website is just joshuadubois.com, and I don't have a Snapchat, which my little sister is very pleased with the fact that I do not have a Snapchat, so... I'll talk you into getting a Snapchat one of these days. (laughs) Absolutely. Dude, well, thank you so much, Joshua, for being on the show. I think that um, you have given me an incredible perspective on politics through the years. And um, I have no doubt that uh, everything you shared today is is going to really resonate with people. Oh, so thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the world, man. You are stitching people across the globe together in a way that's really making us a little bit uh, more healthy, a little bit more whole. And I, I really appreciate this podcast and all your listeners and, and your work um, yourself, Brandon. So thanks, man. That means a lot, man. Uh, yeah. Keep being awesome. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is part of the Gradient Podcast Network and is created in collaboration between me, Brandon Harvey, and Gradient. Find them on Facebook and Twitter at gradient.is. That's gradient, D-O-T-I-S. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed the conversation, make sure you subscribe so that new conversations with incredible people pop up on your phone as soon as they're live. If you want to tweet, Instagram, or Snapchat me, feel free to reach out at at Brandon Harvey. That's Brandon with an E-N. And you can learn more about me and sign up for my good newsletter at brandonharvey.com. The newsletter is actually getting a facelift this week. It's going to look really, really sexy. So (laughs) that sounds so stupid to describe a newsletter that way, but it's going to look so good. And of course, it'll be filled with hopeful news stories from around the world. So seriously, go sign up right now. And that's it for this week's episode. See you next week when we get the opportunity to learn from another incredible person. Sound good?